this line of code could be vulnerable. Now that seems odd, right? It's one of the most basic checks that you can write, but instead of theorizing, let's just start trying to crack this. Then we'll talk about its practicality, how this impacts you and what you can do about it in a bit. Hi, I'm James from betterstack.com. Subscribe and let's get cracking. The first thing we need then is a random key that we're actually going to try and crack. For that, I have this script here called generatekey.ts and it's super simple. All it does is it uses random bytes from Node.js's crypto. It generates a random key between five and 15 characters and it writes it to a file called key.txt. If I open that up here and run the script a few times, you can see the key inside of here is changing. What I'll do now is I will close this key.txt, run the script one more time with my shush option, which means that it doesn't print out what that key is. And now we have to try and crack the key. The next thing I'm going to need is an API that we're actually going to protect with that API key. For that, I have some super simple bun code. As you can see, it has one route called slash protected. It gets the API key from the header in the fetch request. And if it matches, it says you cracked the code status 200. Otherwise, it will say invalid API key status 403 forbidden. Now, for the first demo, I'm actually using a slow compare function instead of the string comparison that you would normally use. The reason for that is so I can explain the logic of how most string comparisons work in all programming languages and also exaggerate the issue a little bit. What well, you can see in this slow compare and the same way that string comparison works is it takes in two strings and it first compares the length of those strings. If the strings don't match in length, it will go ahead and return early. If they do match in length, it will then move on to the next steps where it goes character by character to see if they match. Again, if it finds a character that doesn't match in the other string, it will go ahead and exit early before checking the rest of the string. All I've done in slow compare here is I've added a sleep of two milliseconds in between each step. Do you see where this could be exploited yet? Don't worry if you don't, let's keep cracking. The first thing we need to find out is the length of the API key that we're trying to crack. For that, I'll use this function here. What this does is it tries an API key against our endpoint of various lengths all the way up to 50, and it records the one that took the longest to get a response from. As you can see down here, it also does that five times for each API length, just to make sure that we have some samples for accuracy. And then down here, we record the one that had the longest average time. Why? Because theoretically, the one that took the longest is the one that moved on to do more additional steps, aka the lengths matched. And that's going to be exaggerated by the fact that we had that sleep of two milliseconds in between each step in our slow compare. Let's test if that theory works then. With our server up and running, we'll go ahead and run our crack length script. As you can see, it's trying all of the various lengths up to 50, and it's reporting the average response time that we got back. And it thinks that the length is 12 characters, because if we scroll up here, we can see most of them are around the 0.4 milliseconds mark. But if we get to 12 characters, it took 2.64 milliseconds, so quite a significant jump in the timing. Now that we think we know the length, we can now move on to cracking the individual characters. For that, the logic is almost the exact same, except we're essentially doing educated brute forcing. In the crack key function, we take in a length, which we hopefully just worked out with our length cracker. Then what this does is it generates an API key that starts out as all A, so say the length was three, it would be AAA. And then in each position, so starting at the first position, it tests all of these characters against our API, and the one that took the longest should theoretically be the correct character. That's because it had to run through more steps in that slow comparison function, as it would have moved on to the next character. As you can see down here, we're also sampling this as well. And then once it's found the longest characters in each position, it puts that all together, and that is hopefully our API key. All I need to do then is run the crack.ts script with the length of 12, hit enter, and as you can see, it's testing every single character in each position here. It thinks the first position is B since that took the longest, it thinks the second position is A, and this is going to continue until it's done all 12 characters, and hopefully we have the correct API key. And there we go, it says that it has cracked the key and hopefully that does match. What happens if I go ahead and cat my key.txt here, we should see the exact same key. Now to ignore the percentage sign, this confused me before, that's actually added by the terminal to show that this text file had no new line indicator at the end, but hopefully this does match and it looks to me like yes, it did successfully crack the key, even though I've never seen this one before. So we have broken into this API. Now, if you're sat there thinking it can't possibly be this easy, or you've already typed up some comment about how it's impractical, trust me, I know. There's a couple of caveats that you should be aware of. In practice, time delays produced by the real string comparison functions are negligible compared to delays caused by other sources like your network, even when you're on local hosts. So we try and crack this now using the real string comparison function from JavaScript. You can see that it doesn't really work. It says the API key has a length of one when we know that's not true. It should be 12 as it's the exact same API key that I had before. Even if we knew the length of the API key somehow, so we said key 12, you can see it's probably going to give a completely random answer as there's a load of additional noise 
that makes it quite difficult to measure the delay of the actual comparison. There we go, you can see the answer is completely incorrect. But don't get mad at me yet, this was used to educate you about other real attacks that can take place in a similar way. Previous research has actually suggested that a threshold of 30 microseconds for an operation is enough to perform a timing attack, and another paper listed those operations that it found susceptible, like MD5 of an 8 by string, complex JSON string passing, SQLite memory select, and so on. In fact, another really common example of a timing attack is cracking valid usernames. Look at this code here. When the username is valid, it then checks the password. That means if the username is valid, the request takes longer. So attackers could possibly check an email list against your site to see what accounts they need to focus on to crack that passwords. In the real world though, timing attacks of all kinds crop up with various CVEs. There's an attack known as Minerva, which Claude summarizes here as being able to recover ECDSA private keys by measuring signature speeds, since vulnerable implementations take different amounts of time based on whether the random nonce has leading zero bits or not. This attack has CVEs all the way up to 2024, and you can see how that simple logic that I explained earlier scales up into quite complex attacks. So, since all code takes some amount of time to run, and pretty much all code has conditionals, what can we actually do to protect ourselves? Well, for critical checks, Node actually already has you covered. You can use timing safe equal, which takes in two buffers, but most importantly, takes a constant amount of time, no matter if there's an early exit or not. You could create your own function to achieve this as well, like constant time equal. An even simpler method would just be rate limiting your API to make brute forcing impractical. So there we go, now you know a common attack vector, and yes, the common examples have largely been mitigated, but it crops up from time to time. Let me know if you knew about this in the comments down below, subscribe, and as always, see you in the next one.